Right now, I am an associate editor of the Academy of Management Review, and the section I'm in charge of is one in which, to the moment, people are invited to write about books that have inspired them. Books that, that don't have to be in management, they don't have to be nonfiction, any kind of book that informs their scholarship. And starting after April, we will also include the visual arts. So what I'm going to do today is take advantage of that approach and to use a book that has certainly inspired my understanding of what Marie-José and Marielle have been talking about. And that is a book that I believe is familiar to all of you. And so let's start, Le Petit Prince. So let's start with a statement that the fox says is very simple. Oh, we can only see with our hearts what's essential is invisible to our eyes. The, the fox says this is simple. To many people, this would not be simple. Uh, it, it's, it's a paradox in some ways. How is it that you can't see with your eyes what you can see with your heart? Because your eyes are your eyes. This is, as a whole, a book that is full of very strange queries. How does somebody see? From whom does somebody learn? What is essential? And also, how does dialogue happen? And those, as we could tell, are to some topic, some, many of those topics have come up already today. One of the reasons these questions are important is that, to my mind, they do a very good job of speaking to academics and practitioners in dialogue. And I'm aware that I'm in the middle between Aura and Marielle. But there, so I'm, I'm bookended with one academic and one practitioner. So I will try to be in the middle. But they speak to questions like, between an academic and practitioner, can a dialogue take place effectively? If so, how? And to what ultimate purpose? So. In this presentation, I'm basically going to describe what I have learned from Marie-José and Marielle and their joint work about their answers, basically, to these questions. How they see, how they learn, how their dialogue happens. And also about handling polarities. Uh, the default way of handling polarities is to pit one side against the other. I can see with my heart or I can see with my eye, eyes. What are the other? They can't both be right. And, and Maria's nodding. She absolutely agrees with that. One or the other, right? Uh, are we going to learn or are we going to perform? Are we going to be consistent all the time? Or are we actually going to do something like adaptive strategy where we might change in response to what the needs are of somebody else? And in particular, the visible and the invisible, which is a very interesting polarity. What's visible isn't invisible and vice versa. But as I've learned from Marie, uh, and I've learned from many of you here today, about the importance of dialogically handling them, which means, in part, not just a simple assertion, but an ongoing, sustained, living dialogue in which polarities become not either or, but both and. And it doesn't just have, I mean, it, it was very simple for me to just type these. That, that was a cinch. But to have that actually mean something in practice is totally different. So at least from an academic practitioner perspective, one of the things a living dialogue involves is an academic experiencing a manager's concerns by participating in what happens in the manager's world. Now, we can flip it over and say, 
a manager participates in what happens in an academics world, but I wouldn't wish that on any manager. <laughs> it might be interesting for us, but the two engage in dialogues over time. It, just does, it doesn't just happen once. Uh, it doesn't just happen twice in a short period of time. And in the dialogues, they work to increase their ability to hold, to recognize polarities and to hold them both as true. So what I have learned is that for more than a decade, Rui Jose and Marielle have met regularly for several hours that are planned meetings, that are extended conversations, and they've addressed a number of issues of concern to them, especially most frequently about Beauvais International, of which Marielle is the CEO, but sometimes also issues that Marie raises for herself. These issues are often polarities, and one of the paper, paper that we're working on, we've addressed several of these, but in this one, I'm just going to focus on the polarity of the visible and the invisible, especially with regard to excellent service performance which is not something that specifically the fox was talking to the little prince about. And this is the interesting polarity to me. When, when Uncle B.I. Uh, runs into problems with shipments, they always tell the clients, oh, I'm very sorry we couldn't do this because of this problem. But when they do something extraordinarily well, when the client calls at the last minute and says, oh, I know I gave you a month to get this to this place, but actually I need it by tomorrow morning. They just say, oh, yeah, okay. They, they, I'm, not, I'm sure they don't say it like that, but they, they, they don't say anything that says, what, they don't make visible that this is a big deal that they're able to do this. So the issue arose as Mary Ellis reflecting on um, we actually do some things that are really wonderful that our competitors don't. Is it possible for us to let our clients know that, to make that visible? And she became aware that even the people who work at BI were not even always aware <coughs> of how extraordinary the service was that they were creating. So she cre carried out an exercise that I believe Marie was part of to help the BI teams become aware of what they were doing. And it, it, the exercise looked like this. Here is an event that happens. Okay, the truck reaches the, the destination depot. Is it visible or invisible? Well, <coughs> ordinarily not. It's not visible, it's just, this is just something that happens. You know, we didn't get all carried away with coffee because the coffee happened. Uh, but if the coffee hadn't been there on time, we would have been very conscious of that. And that was the case. So she said, well, what about if we start figuring out how to make visible the work we did that's, that's well done, make visible to us, and then to, then to the clients. So the hope was that after this work, after they spent a considerable amount of time talking about making visible what they had not been making visible. And after Marie interviewed a large number of the people who worked for BI, and they were all very conscious intellectually of what was going on, then, then they started to pay attention to what actually happened. So I can present it like this. Before the exercise, the people at BI would say, well, we'll see if we can accomplish this in a really difficult situation. Oh, yeah, we did it, we did it. The expectation was, intellectually they'd say, sure, we can accomplish the shift because our system enables it and so forth, and here are some of the things that we are doing that are making this possible. And oh, incidentally, the company over here doesn't have a clue how to do that. I'm making this, some of this up, I'm sorry. What happened in practice afterwards was, we'll see if we can accomplish the shift. Oh yeah, we did it. In other words, although the employees understood intellectually 
the difference and we're able to hold the polarity of the visible and invisible. In practice, it was a bit, they weren't, they are not, well, as of when we wrote the paper a couple weeks ago, they weren't doing it quite. <laughs> Maybe it's changed last week. I don't. Uh, so I just want to think about this, what we can learn. It's not that hard to learn to handle a polarity intellectually, or at least it's comparatively not that hard. It's really easy to write the word and instead of versus. Um, there are a lot of organization development interventions that I'm aware of that are designed based on the fact that people need to think in a way that handles polarities, but all they do is really the intellectual focus, and it only lasts for the, the length of the exercise. And one of the things that Marie and Marielle have learned is that if people are going to be able to handle polarities, they first have to be able to do it intellectually. The employees first need to be able to say to themselves, the reason we were able to change this shipment was the following. But even that may not hold. It may need to be repeated time after time. And the learnings in practice about how to hold polarities. Um, mean that in practice, it's almost like muscle memory. You ha your body has to be able to do it. You can't just talk about it. And that's hard. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of discipline, and it takes a lot of patience, and a lot of repetition. So the fox gave us a really good perspective on this. So I will read what the fox said, sort of, in English. One only understands the things that one tames said the fox, so that the one tames, by that I understand what, what is being done over time. Men have no more time to understand anything. <coughs> they buy things already made at the shops, but there is no shop anywhere where one can buy arresting moments or the capability of handling polarities dialogically in practice. <laughs> so, uh, so if, if you want that, uh, you, you can't just buy it ready-made. It, it isn't just going to happen. So he says, if you want a friend, tame me, which is kind of contradictory in itself, which is one of the things that makes it interesting. The little prince says, what must I do to tame you? Oh, and for me, it's also interesting that the, a fox is teaching a prince. That's not what one would ordinarily expect. <laughs> uh, so what does the fox say? Fox says you have to be really patient. Uh, and you can't rush it. You can't just demand that it happen. First, you sit down a little distance from me. Don't push me. I'll look at you out of the corner of my eye. You'll say nothing. Words are the source of misunderstandings. We can say the words all the time, but that's not necessarily the practice. But you'll sit a little closer to me every day, and after a while, the fox, uh, the, the little prince tamed the fox. But I would say in the case the illustration I just described, taming is still going on in practice. So here's what I think Marie Jose's and Marielle's work attributes. The importance of developmental processes for being able to handle polarities in practice, dialogically. The willingness to learn, both intellectually and in practice, on the part of the academic and practitioner, and that involves being vulnerable. 
for both of them. Academics like me, are often we feel like it's a good deal when we're doing a research project because we can't lose. You know, there could be all kinds of problems in the company, but we just get to describe them. And this is saying something very different that the research can, researcher can be vulnerable to. The value of deep, sustained dialogue and friendship between an academic and practitioner, which is very rare. The discipline that makes this possible, as I mentioned in their case, 10 years of regular dialogues that have a plan that involve multiple hours. Or as the little prince put it, it would have been better to come back at the same hour, said the fox. If, for example, you come at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then at 3 o'clock I shall begin to be happy. I shall feel happier and happier as the hour advances. Now, I appreciate that I gave this talk at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I must say that for me personally, at 3 o'clock, I started getting more and more nervous. <laughs> but nevertheless, we were involving the proper rights. So here is a brief epilogue. From my perspective, Marie Jose provides a wonderful example of what many academics preach and few actually do in practice in terms of working with practice managers and other practitioners. Marielle is a wonderful example of a scholar practitioner, a role discussed a lot in academic and scholarly writing, at least in the US, but rarely seen in person, in practice. So I hope that, unlike the narrator and the little prince, when, it, when the plane is fixed and it's time to fly back, Marie Jose and Marielle are not ready yet to say adieu or a demain or au revoir. <laughs>